This is the second of a two-part interview with the Reverend Dr. Timothy Ahrens, Senior Minister of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, Columbus, Ohio. These interviews are part of a project of the Heritage Committee of First Church. I'm Nancy Gilson Braverman, and for this interview, I'll be walking with Tim through the sanctuary of First Church, where he has preached for more than two decades. So, Reverend Tim, describe this beautiful place and how it contributes to meaningful relationships with God, the Holy Spirit, the clergy, and other worshipers. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, uh, we're talking about one of my favorite places on earth. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a couple names that I have for this space, the Sanctuary of First Church. And the overall space of First Church, but I, I like to refer to this as the house that justice built. Mm -hmm. um, that if you do the right thing, as our abolitionist forebearers did in 1852 when they started First Church, uh, it, it, with the purpose of worshiping God, believing in Jesus Christ, and believing that Jesus Christ leads us to liberate people from slavery. I mean, this all connected for them very clearly. But if you do the right thing, it can turn into something very beautiful, and in this case, it has. Um, the other thing that I like to say about um, this sanctuary is it's a cathedral of grace. I mean, it is both when you worship here, you feel the power and the presence of God's grace and God's love, um, but it is a graceful space. Um, and. Um, and it, it, it was designed that way. I mean, so there's a whole bunch of things you can say about this, this sanctuary. Um, when you're in here, first of all, when we opened in December 1931, um, the only windows that were in the sanctuary were the, uh, the one in the front of the nave, which is the Jeffrey window, and it tells the life story of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Right over the chancel, um, looking down at us, um, and Jesus in the top window is sitting as the, the ascending Christ is sitting on a rainbow. And I love to tell the story when I got here, it looked like he was in the lotus position. He has his hands <laughs> out, right? All the coal dust had covered the window in such a way that you couldn't see the rainbow. So when we redid the window 15 years ago. Oh, it's um, been that long. Yeah, yeah, oh it's been gosh, that long, yeah. yeah. And uh, when we redid it, we took it out a million pieces of glass, right? Yeah. Literally a million pieces yeah, of glass. Yeah, and somebody counted, right? Right, the yeah. guy who did it. The yeah. guy who did it counted. <laughs> yeah, so, so I asked him, I said, how many pieces of glass? He goes, a million, maybe give or two, take one or two. But uh, we realized there's a rainbow. So it's this beautiful, peaceful um, ascension that he's, that he's entering heaven on, on, the, on the wings of love, but also on the promise of hope that the rainbow brings. So, yeah. Anyway. And I, but, I love the uh, Lenten, was it the Lenten sermon series you did? Yes, That yeah. focused on the windows, yeah. the, the different um, panes of the Jeffrey window. And, and one, of the, one of the things that's important is it tells the story of Jesus. In the center of the, win of the Jeffrey window, you have what the artist considered to be the two main uh, focuses or foci of Jesus, and that is teaching and healing and preaching and so so you got healing i'm sorry it's healing and preaching and teaching so you can see the two of them and then they're surrounded by the gospel uh symbols of the gospels matthew mark luke and john so um you know so i, I love that because the center of the center right the mm -hmm. center of the sanctuary is the healing and the teaching and preaching of jesus and surrounded by the strength of the gospels that tell his story and then of course the other the other windows open up. But the, uh, the other thing is, it, in, the, in the two sides, in the transepts of the cross, if you will, because the sanctuary is in the shape of a cross, um, you have on the east transept the friendship window, which is symbolic of uh, the connections we have to one another. And then the Gladden window is on the west transept and shows in large figures, as I like to say, the largest figures of justice and mercy I've ever seen in class. Um, very prominent, the cornucopia in the one, the sword of justice in the other. So 
holding together in memory of Washington Gladden the balance of justice and mercy, which, you know, I've, I've often believed that you, you can't do one. You can't just do the mercy ministries of the church. You have to do the justice ministries yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and, and they have to be in tension with one another, but always to serve our neighbors in need. And then um, you have the rose window, which is not seen well in yeah, the sanctuary it's it's because behind it's behind the, the beautiful Beckerot organ, right? Right, right. So uh, there's a story actually that um, Chalmers Co. told me because it was in his time that the Beckerot was brought into the sanctuary, built into the sanctuary. And um, the promise of the artist was that the window would rise over the Beckerot organ. So it Oops. would be like a sun, you know, <laughs> over, the, over the organ. And it was beautiful, the picture they had. Yeah. So, but he said, as the summer went on and the organ went up, he realized that wasn't going to happen. Right? Oh, <laughs> like no. He just said, oh, no, it's right. It's uh. like, not going to sell anyway. Uh, but the beautiful rose window is filled, again, with, with the story of faith. I mean, you, you, we're not looking at it right now. But then in the upper Clara Story windows, you have the days of creation. Um, and there's eight windows. And I love this because you have each of the days in Genesis 1 through 7. And the eighth window is symbolic of the day that in Judaism, it's believed the eighth day of creation is our day. In other words, God has given us all of this and now it's ours to start this new week this new life of care for the earth care for one another so the eighth day of creation is the day that we're given to do this right uh -huh. which i love and then the parables are in the lower windows but what is beautiful about this the windows of the sanctuary is they were added generation to generation so you have colors and combination of glass that someone may say they don't all match. Well, that's the whole point. I mean, neither does our faith, right? It doesn't, yeah. doesn't always work together that way. But what it does is it means that this cathedral is owned by us, yeah. right? I mean, we, yeah. we, we built these windows, right? There are people still living whose families dedicated these windows in generations past. And so, it kind, kind yeah. of speaks to the living right, organism right. of the church. Right. That this kept, was a continuum. Yeah. That this kept going on. Yeah. I made, pe people have said to me, it reminds them of Riverside Church in, in New York. And I say, not at all. Because in my mind, I find the windows of Riverside to be oppressive. And they say, oppressive? That's a strong word. I said, yeah. John Rockefeller gave all the money for the church and he built it right? It's John Rockefeller's church. I said, this is our church, right? Yeah. This isn't Washington Gladden's church. It's not somebody else's church. This is ours. These are the organs that were built in our time. These are, this is our space and we belong in it and grow with it as a result. So yeah. I, I love that about this space. It really is the space of the people and it's the space of the people of God. So Before we talk yeah. about the organs yeah. and the music in this, in this sanctuary, talk a little bit about the tapestries. Absolutely. The yeah. tapestries are remarkable. Um, the tapestries are two of nine in a series of the story of Abraham made in Britain. So moving on to the uh, Beccarat. So the Beccarat was built in 1972 and built by one of the most famous organ builders in Germany, um, von Beckerat, and he came to Columbus. And uh, when he came into this space, he announced that he would not build an organ in this room until we got the crap off the ceiling. And I'm sure there was a special German word for that, but, um, but you know, he, so we had these tiles on our ceiling that had meant to be acoustical tiles in the 20s and 30s when it was built. And basically they, I mean, for every imaginable reason, not the least of which is there was asbestos in them, they had to come off, right? What they did was instead of, they, they were absorbing sound. And so what happened when those tiles came off and wood, just wood replaced them, it became a, almost from what people describe who know this stuff, and I am not one of them, became an, an acoustical, an acoustically perfect room. Huh. So this room is used by musicians a lot. I, I will have uh, folks who are auditioning for Pro Musica or for the, for the Columbus Symphony who will come in here to practice, to hear themselves play 
before they go to play for those they're auditioning for. Oh, interesting. And oh. Um, that's been true through the years I've been here. And um, so the Beckerat is, is a German tracker organ. Um, I, I refer to it as true play. So what, when your finger goes down, it has to activate um, the stop and it comes up and the note plays. So what you play is what you get. The other, you can move across the keyboard differently. So this is, this is very Germanic, right? So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's great for any kind of um, German music. I, Bach, of course, is best on this organ. It used to be a comment that I would make when Denny Bernard was playing it. I, I said I could never tell if that was Bach or Bernard that was there. I mean, I'd look up and say, <laughs> is he back? Is Bach back? Is, oh, it's Bernard. I mean, you know, he, he was one with the spirit of, uh, yeah. of Johann Sebastian Bach. And, um, and it, it is a magnificent instrument. But both instruments are precious in their own right. And the Kimball was restored in 2003, so 22 years ago, 21, 22 years ago. Yeah. And therefore, you have both instruments alive and playing every Sunday. Um, and each one is different. I, I refer to them when they're playing together, and there are times they play together at Easter and other occasions. Um, it's like two whales crying to each other in the <laughs> ocean. I mean, each having its own distinct sound, but uh -huh. each beautiful and big and powerful in its own right so yeah. Um, yeah they're magnificent instruments and the choir uh, that accompanies um, the instrument is amazing and we have a harpsichord and one of the best concert pianos anywhere right. in this space as well I mean yeah. often overlooked are the fact that we have a world-class harpsichord and a world-class concert piano that is now ours uh, we purchased it last year yeah. so it used to yeah. belong to the Southern Theater and we would house it when it wasn't being used, but now we purchased it, so. All contributing to one of the things that people just love so much about this church is the high class music. Oh. Just. The music, there's no one that comes into the space who doesn't walk out changed by the music. Absolutely. And now yeah. we've added the handbells. Oh yeah. Unbelievable. They're, they're gorgeous. And they're, they're beautiful. And yes. Jennifer Fry has taken those bells and the the choir of ringers and changed this place with a whole new sound so Absolutely. yeah they played so, yesterday and we were all blown away so, so we're walking south okay. down toward the uh, entrance of the church talk a little bit about these doors down here in the entrance and yeah. then and then the um the veterans memorial well, let me, let me talk about the Veterans Memorial, more, Memorial first because um, we're, I'm looking at it now and then I'll get to the doors in a second. Okay. But um, so Pearl Harbor, you know, December 7th, 1941, um, all hell breaks loose. Right? I mean, we, we, yeah. We're, we're uh, having to defend ourselves in war, first in the Pacific and then into, um, into uh, Europe and... Uh, so we send, in the course of World War II, over the next four or five years, we send 238 men and women, 230 men and eight women. And from we had this a, church. From this church. Uh -huh. And, and I, I always have to say, think about that. Yeah. Think how big this church was and how young it was mm -hmm. that you could send 238 men and women into uh, battle or into the service. And um, what they would have on this back wall, so the first thing that was added, if you will, to this Cathedral of Grace, that it opened just 10 years before, right? So um, they would put the soldiers' names with pins on a cork board as they would leave. So they were sort of pinned there, and, you know, and many of them would go in, in waves of soldiers, right? So it wouldn't be just one at a time. I mean, you'd have 10 or 15 up at the same time. So there was, each one was in the order that they went to war. Uh -huh. And then if they were killed in battle or lost, somehow lost their lives in that war, we would have a special star by their name. Um, and others won awards for their valor and their, and their fight in the war. But what happened was, what became a great wall of honor, when I, by the time I got here in 2000, 
I described it as like a board of shame because I mean it was it looked shameful. I'm not yeah. not the names, but yeah, it was yeah. it was bad. You know, yeah. that's not how you honor people. Adam Wade took on this wall as uh, he comes from a great family of Marines, right? Took on the wall as his as his Eagle Scout project. And I'm forever grateful. He turned that wall into a gorgeous, gorgeous wall of honor. From alphabetically now we have the same 238 in alphabetical order from, from A through Z. And then we have a book for people to sign the names of their loved ones who have defended this country in war in any time, in any age, and of course the United States flag beside it. So for me it's actually a place where I come to pray. Uh, there's a kneeler there and so I'll come and pray through the book um, because I want to honor them oh, and that's, uh, continue that's to honor them. Yeah. So, I, I put yeah. my dad's name, he's a World War II vet, served in the South Pacific, I put his name in there. Good. And my dad is in there too, so yes. it's, I agree, it's just, it's actually comforting to know that somewhere in this room, our father's names are yeah. also recorded, that's great. right? Yeah. So we carry yeah. our family with us yeah. anyway, but now they're there, so that's yeah. true. So we're in, we're in what is the Broad Street entrance to the church, and we're approaching what we call the North X. Um, and someone said, why would you call it the North X if it's on the south side of the building? I said, no, North X, N-A-R-T-H-E-X. Um, so that means entrance. Um, and what you have here, Nancy, is actually the last of our cathedral glass. So it's very significant. The glass going from the sanctuary into the narthex is cathedral glass, which occupied most of the windows of this sanctuary before the stained, before glass. The stained glass was put in generation by generation. Yeah. So it's the original glass of the church, but you get a feeling for what it used to look like everywhere, right? Yeah. And then we step out into the narthex and um, two absolutely stunning uh, windows that have been added here, which I think are perfectly complementary to one another. Uh, the Bernard window, which is representative of Denny's 30 years of service as our choir director, uh, excuse me, organist and choir master emeritus. Yeah. And he served from 1973 to 2003 and then just recently passed away um, after 20 years as our emeritus. So yeah. um, we, we um, honor him and remember him. And, uh, but this is the music of uh, J.S. Bach that is portrayed in the, in, the, um, in the window. And just gorgeous, gorgeous colors and to the um, West, so that's on the east side of yeah, the narthex. Right. To the west, you have the social justice window um, that is just new, has not yet been dedicated, uh, but will be soon. And it was based on the inspiration of Howard Thurman, who um, was truly one of the great spiritual um, voices of justice in the, in the last century. So. That's and, cool. Yeah, and what, what is cool about this window is it's the only window in the building related to the sanctuary or the chapel that has clear glass in the window itself so that you, there's places you can look out and see the social justice park, which is just outside the door, and there's places they can look in and see this, this you know, temple of holiness, if you will. So, um, so it's very, very cool, and um, I think the two most powerful witnesses of this congregation through time have been our music ministry and our justice. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Our justice spirit. Yeah. So the fact that when you enter this great cathedral of grace, you, you're greeted by justice and music. I just, you know, I just right. love that welcome. So. And, and what a fabulous addition to the campus was the social justice yeah. park. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's meant to be. I mean, it was the... <laughs> It was the last window, you know, looking out or looking on the outside of the building that had yet to have stained glass in it. And so um, it, it made sense. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so as we were walking Ellen back... Murat, Ellen Murat made both windows, so it's really great because she um, did them. Let me tell you one more story. Sure. This is really cool. 
So when Ellen dedicated um, the Bernard window, the music window, she told a story that um, sh her studio in Jersey overlooked the Twin Towers in New York City. And the day that the towers were taken down in the Terrorist Act in 2001, on 9-11, um, she could see it all happening from across the river. And um, it broke her spirit, it broke her heart, and she stopped making art. So we called her knowing she was a great, you know, um, great stained glass artist, and she said, I'm not doing that anymore. So I said to her, you know, she told me the story, and I said to her, would you consider this, that we will send you the, the music of Denny Bernard playing J.S. Bach. Oh, wow, this makes me cry, wow. And she says, I'll listen to it. And she called me back a few weeks later, and she said, I'll do it. And then she proceeded to make the windows while listening to Bach. Oh, that is doesn't such a, get better that's that. so beautiful. <laughs> and that she told so that story beautiful. to the congregation oh. when the dedication happened. And I love that story uh, because it speaks volumes to, uh, you know, who she is, but also the power of, of Bach, the power of music to heal, uh, to literally heal. So... so so many, so many, many moments you've had in this beautiful place. Hard question. Can you think of a few of them that just, <laughs> you know, you'll take, take with you forever? Well, um, it's funny because I think on any given day I might say it differently. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, it's the totality of the experience. Um, it is humbling truly humbling to be the senior minister of First Congregational Church. Um, it is, um, it's humbling to have the honor of stepping up the four steps every Sunday or many Sundays to preach in a pulpit when it was built, um, the sanctuary was built, it was called a preaching station. Really? Um, in the architectural designs, we're building a <laughs> preaching station. So, in, in you know, in That's the twenty first century, like. yeah, I know. In, in the twenty first century, it's like, what's that? <laughs> so, anyway, um, it was built for preaching, right? And uh, so, to be a part of any of that, if it was only once that I had done it in my lifetime, I would have been honored. But to do that so often for so many years is humbling. In, in many ways. Um, so that, I mean, again, just the honor of being able to do that is significant for me. That, but, you know, in this room, uh, so many things have happened. Um, I, I go back to thinking, speaking of 9-11, 9-12, mm -hmm. uh, um, after we called the community together here to worship on, on September 12, 2001. And the place was standing room only, filled with all faiths, mm -hmm. all people, many different faiths. And people got up to speak and pray. And um, it was a very, very powerful evening. And I love telling the story as I'm standing in the center aisle before we're all starting. I'm greeting people. They're coming in. They're taking seats. Um, Buddhist monks were here in Columbus. And uh, in their orange robes, with their shaved heads, Three of them come down the center aisle and one stops and he says to me, are you the pastor? Because they were sent to talk to me. Right? Uh -huh. and, and I said, yes. And he said, may we speak tonight? I said, absolutely. And he says, you just need to know that it's going to be okay. Oh, wow. Just like, uh -huh. you know, it's kind of like, whoa, from the other side of the world <laughs> to Columbus, Ohio, it's going to be okay? We're not feeling that were tonight. They, were, they, so. were they stuck here? The I think yeah, they were stuck the here. Because <laughs> all the plates are crowded. So, so um, anyway, so, yeah. but that was a very rich, um, very rich moment. Um, you know, the dedication of the Kimball organ, mm -hmm. that um, special music that was written for that occasion, um, and the two instruments playing together on that day, particularly because Jim Pullman, who um, was the moderator at the time we received the gift and began the work mm -hmm. on rebuilding the Kimball organ, uh, was beginning to really fail in health. And 
it was the last time he would ever be in the sanctuary. Oh, so sitting uh -huh. beside him, as it just he was, he had a form of ALS, and he was beginning to hunch over. Oh. But he sat up straight on the last piece. And at the moments like that, it's it's moments with people here, um, and. Um, you know, so many incredible weddings and baptisms. And, oh, and you are you know, definitely just... the baby whisperer. <laughs> I love the baptisms when you walk the babies down the aisle. And yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one cry, but they probably have. <laughs> <laughs> Someone claimed theirs cried to me. We were talking about this the other day, and I didn't remember it. But <laughs> it, it's funny because I did have a baptism way back when, Nancy, where in my first church in Cleveland, the child cried the entire time, right? Just <laughs> wailing. And the mother says to me at the end of it, she says, I sure wish that we'd waited a couple days. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, he's cutting four teeth right now. I'm going, did you try Origel? <laughs> like, no, we didn't do that. I was like, well, thanks. That'd you know, be the first like, baby. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 first child. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, I would have to say that our 150th celebration was great, but... To me, what is great in terms of memories here is the people of God coming together to worship. There's something very powerful about being a downtown church and people coming from every direction, literally from mm -hmm. north, from south, from east and west, and gathering in the center of the city to give glory to God, to give praise to God, and to lift up their prayers, their voices, um, and to have done that generation to generation um, is is very powerful. So mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's a week to week, day to day kind of thing for me that makes First Church so significant and this space so significant in my life. Um, I will tell you that um, one very memorable moment happened <clears throat> on the first Easter of the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and. It was clear that there were going to be four of us in this room the next day. And I came here and sat for hours as the sun was going down to the west and just sitting and watching the light move in the room. And I talked about that in the sermon the next day. And I said, for all of you, you know, who are not here, I'm going to tell you this story. And someone said to me, you described it in such a way that I felt I was there for the first time in weeks in this case, right? It's been weeks. But then the second Easter, <laughs> we were still out of the room, you know, 2001. I, I love this story. I'm, we have musicians in the room, right? We have brass now. We're, we're advancing. We're getting closer, right? Yeah. So there's brass in the room. And I'm preaching. I'm looking down from the pole, but there's like eight guys with brass in their, you know, their instruments in their hand watching me and listening. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's people here, right? So <laughs> Now, I know everybody was out there somewhere, yeah. you know, through all this time. And we definitely had, you know, a congregation that hung together. That's For another sure. beautiful yeah. witness. Yeah. They hung together in the trauma that was the pandemic, uh, you know, in those early, early times. Yeah. Well, it lasted for what seemed like forever, but we came back, right? And yesterday, walking in this room and feeling the power of the Spirit again and just you know, realizing this, this congregation will go on. We will endure and we will grow and we will prosper in the heart of the city because we've got the city in our heart. And so um, here in the heart of the city, we will be fine, yeah. you know, and God will be glorified. So, so yeah. was it, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to say about this beautiful space and your time here? Um, you can make me cry. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't have words. Um, I was telling um, the grief group earlier today in my last meeting with them that one of the books I discovered from my grandfather's library was a book by Washington Gladden. And he had a note inside the book that said, this man could preach and write. And um, we, whether we know it or not, um, this church has been treated um, to one of the great 
creatures of all time. Mm -hmm. And because of his presence here, others have followed. And we've been very fortunate. So I, I count it a blessing um, to think that a person um, such as myself would be able to be the pastor of this church. Oh, that's um, lovely. Yeah. To quote, to quote Lou Gehrig, I'm the luckiest <laughs> man alive. You know, I really feel that's that way. Cool. I'm the luckiest that's man cool. alive. So, so yeah. can, can you send us out with a prayer for us sure. going forward? Sure. Gracious and ever-living, ever-loving God, we do thank you for this day of your creating. We thank you for all the magnificent ways you have touched our lives in this day. And we're grateful for this space, this place that is holy and set aside. Our Cathedral of Grace, this house that justice built, we have been blessed that you have led us here and brought us here person by person through the generations to be blessed by its beauty and to um, take that beauty inside ourselves and share it with others. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over First Church, that you would continue to bless her with all of your gifts of grace and love, and through the time ahead, um, inspire the members and friends of this congregation to shine your light. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.